and WhatsApp groups. All our campuses all over the world. We want to welcome all of you to the service. We love you and it's always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Are we excited to be here this morning? Can we celebrate the word of God with a shout this morning? <laughs> Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of God today. <clears throat> The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Mm -mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 17. Mm -mm. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Next verse. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself. By Jesus Christ. And had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now to drive home the point. Let's look at verse 16 of the same 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea though we have known Christ after the flesh. Yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. Give me the amplified of verse 16, the amplified version. He says, consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man, yet now we have, we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. In terms of the flesh. Can somebody from the protocol move this fan away? It is interfering with my anointing. <laughs> <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right. So that is, we do not see again, or we do not estimate or see people from the human point of view. We now look at people through the eyes of the word of God. When we look at people, we use the word of God to look at people. That is our binoculars for looking at people is the word of God. Remember we said that not everybody in the world is a child of God. He says, behold in 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. Now are we the sons of God. The Bible tells us also in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and 19 that we belong to the household of God. The minute you are born again, you belong to the family. The word household means family of God. So there is a family of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 and 15. Ephesians 3 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family, verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So you belong to the household of God the minute you're born again. So there's a family of God. And there's a family in the earth, in heaven and on earth. It is called the household of God. The household of God is the church. The church is the body of Christ. The family of God. And God is our father. So all of us belong that are born again to the same family. It is the family of God. But not everybody on earth is born of God. So Jesus in John 8.44 talks about those whose father is the devil. In John 8.44, you are of your father the devil. So there are people whose father is the devil. First John chapter 3 verse 10. First John chapter 3 verse number 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. So there are children of God and there are children of the devil. So there are two families on earth. There are two families on earth. And every human being belongs to one of these two families. And that is why we have established that anyone who has refused to receive the gospel of Christ is in the family of Satan. We exhausted that a few days ago in the course of this teaching. And we must not, cannot have close relationship, intimate relationship with an unbeliever. A child of God cannot have any form of intimacy with an unbeliever. 
Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. There's no relationship between light and darkness. Christ and Belial have nothing in common. The temple of God and the temple of idols cannot fellowship. Light and darkness does not coexist together. So, as a child of God, when you got saved, your friendship changed. You're no more a friend of the world. Because friendship with the world is enmity with God. A man that is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So a child of God is born of God. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. You are a brand new being. You are a species that never existed before. You are a race of being that this earth cannot understand. The world knew, knew him not. Therefore, it knows us not. The world doesn't know us. So we can be their friend. They hate Jesus. They cannot love you. You can't be their friend. To befriend an unbeliever is to associate with Satan. Because every unbeliever is a child of Satan. There are only two families. <laughs> the family of God and the family of the devil. You cannot be a child of God by accident. You have to be born and you're only birthed into the kingdom of God by the gospel of Christ. There are no two ways about it. All right? So now, in the first service, we began to look at the relationship between a husband and wife. And we zeroed in on the wife. I will encourage you to get the teachings of the first service if you are not here. Because I do not intend to go over those, those things I taught anymore. I'm just going to shoot from where we stopped. Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Submit yourselves to your own. If your Bible is mine, I will underline your own. Why does he use your own? It means there's only one person you should submit to. Your husband. Because your husband is your keeper. Your husband is your head. Give me the amplified of Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. <clears throat> Colossians 3 18. Wives be subject to your husbands. Subordinate and adapt yourselves to them. As is right and fitting. And your proper duty in the Lord. So when you submit to your husband. Who are you submitting to? To Jesus. You are not weak. When a woman submits to her husband, it's not a sign of weakness. It's not. It's submission to Jesus. Submit as in the Lord. So a woman that is submissive to her husband honors Jesus. A woman that submits to her husband honors Jesus. You know, we have adopted many ideas from the world and its traditions. You know, like I was saying in the first service, you hear things like the woman is the neck, the husband is the head. So anywhere the woman likes, the husband must turn to. All those are worldly ideas. They are not Bible. You know, one time they say behind every man is a woman. Then the women liberation movement came out with not behind, it's beside. You know, all, all kinds of things and the, and, uh, you know, uh, all those thoughts were gotten from the women liberation movement. And I have nothing personal against the women liberation movement. Like I said in the first service, and I'm sure, you know, somebody asked at the end of that first service a question on human rights. And I said, first of all, human rights does not, is not scriptural. Because human rights actually came out of oppression, slavery. So the world had a convention to give rights to people. Right to life, right to worship rights to religion right to all the rights okay and the rights are okay in fact in the scripture we have better rights than the human rights in the word of god because in the world system things are not really fair there's no fairness fairness is only in christ you remember the woman caught in the very act of adultery you cannot catch a woman in the act of adultery you cannot catch a woman you are to catch man and woman because a woman does not commit adultery. But they caught a woman. What happened to the man? If it was in the very act. It means two of them were together. Why did you choose to carry the woman? 
So, even in the societal standards, even when Jesus was on earth, the society was against women. Women were oppressed. Women were suppressed. And Christ looked at the woman and said, woman. He didn't call her a prostitute. He didn't abuse her. He called her woman. He gave her back her dignity. There are better rights in Christ than the world can offer. Are you all understanding? And, and that is why in Christ Jesus, we use our rights to serve God. And we use our rights to serve one another. We do not use our rights as an occasion to gratify the flesh. That is where the human right movement has a limitation. Because in the human right movement of the secular, the end profit is personal. Personal profit. Human worship. You know, it ends up in humanism. It ends up in humanism, not in the worship of God. Because again, if you observe some of these secular movements, they are very good. They have their good points, but sometimes they take things to extreme. Where now you have gay, you have, you know, anti-God operations, lesbianism and all of that. And some of these women liberation movement ideologies in Europe have destroyed a lot of homes. Even in Africa, they are coming in because they are bringing in ideologies that do not glorify God. <clears throat> And that's why the church must be careful because what the world defines must not be what we define. We must take our definitions from the scripture. If that's clear, can I have a good amen? Because all scripture is given to us and it is profitable for teaching. And from our teaching, we have our persuasion. From our persuasion, we have our correction. From our correction, we have our instruction in righteousness. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. You know, so we stay within the confines of God's word. Now I had to fix that because somebody asked the question after that service and I answered it within the house, but I wanted the, the secular world, the, I mean the, the global community to benefit from that. Now, so we began to deal with the fact that in Christ Jesus, we stay within the confines of God's word. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 22. <clears throat> Ephesians, wives, submit yourselves unto your own, underline own, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Give me the amplified of Ephesians 5.22. <clears throat> wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. When a woman submits to her husband, she is serving Christ. A woman submitting to her husband is a service to Jesus. A service to Jesus. Who are the wives? A wife is a woman in marriage. A wife is a woman in marriage. It is repeated again. Submit to your husbands. And then sometimes you hear thoughts like, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, come up with thoughts before you make any decision. Make sure your wife agrees. Your wife must agree. If she doesn't agree, you cannot do it. Those thoughts are not from the word of God. Anything you want to do, your wife does not support you, don't do it. No, it's not about your wife supporting it. It's about does the word of God support it. That should be the point. Not does your wife support it. Does the word of God support it? Does it function within the wisdom of God? That's what matters. Because at the end of the day, if you observe, do you agree with the Lord before the Lord does anything? Eh? You don't have to agree with the Lord before he does anything. He doesn't have to wait for your agreement. He is the Lord. And you are to submit as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Do you and the Lord make decisions together? Huh? It's a question. Do you and the Lord make decisions together? No. He makes decisions and you comply. Are we in this building? I need to put things in order. As unto the Lord. Look at verse 23 of Ephesians chapter 5. 
For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. Himself the savior of his body. Did he say the husband is a co-head with the wife? Huh? The husband is a co-head. What did he say? The husband is the head. It's not co-headship. The husband is the head of the wife. Have had, like I said, people say the wife is the neck. So who is the body? The children, who are the legs? The cats and the dogs. The husband is the head, the wife is the body. The husband is the head, the wife is the body. That's the scriptures. The husband is the head of the wife, the wife is the body. There is no mention of children. There are only two people in a marriage, husband and wife. Husband, head, wife, body. So you see, we have imported thoughts. And this is the reason why many Christian marriages shamefully are going down the drain because they have built it on a wrong foundation. Look at verse 23 again of Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Himself, the savior of his body. So he relates the relationship with Christ and the church. Look at verse 40, 24 of that Ephesians chapter 5, 24. 5, 24 Ephesians. Therefore, as the head is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. On the line, in everything. Give me the amplified, amplified version of verse 24. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.24 As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. In everything. So, let the wives be to their husband, their own, own, own husbands in everything. Why does he give this kind of instructions? Don't forget. Don't forget. Because I have heard women say, my husband is not a believer. He doesn't want me to come to church. Should I submit or should I come to church? My husband is not a believer. He doesn't want me to go for evangelism. Should I submit? Because the Bible says, submit in everything. Now listen carefully. These instructions are for believers. These instructions are for believers. Two believers in marriage. Husband born again, wife born again. I will soon get to instructions between a believing wife and an unbelieving husband or a believing husband and an unbelieving wife. But until I get there, don't forget that what we are reading now is for two believers in Christ. So the wife and the husband in Christ, then the wife submit to the husband in everything. An unbeliever cannot love. An unbeliever cannot love. Husband, love your wives. An unbeliever cannot love because the love has to be modeled as Christ. And an unbeliever is not in Christ. So an unbeliever cannot love. What you call love is not what the Bible calls love. The Bible has its own definition of love. And the Bible is our book of instructions. An unbeliever cannot love. Only a believer can love. And the love is as Christ. Love the church. So he's writing to the church. The marriage that is recognized in heaven as of God is between two Christians. The marriage that heaven recognizes as of God is the marriage between two Christians. So he's talking to believers. That's why he said, you submit your husband in everything. I'm going to take you, like I said, to where he speaks to women and men who are married to non-Christians. Who got married before they received the gospel. 
Because he gave them instructions. So he says, who are those involved? Two parties, husband and wife. Does it include the children? No. Who is the head? Please talk to me, Power City. Who is the head? Who is the body? No other person involved. So the instruction here is for Christian women. This letter is not a newspaper. It was written to people in Christ. People in Christ. So it's not a film or a movie. It's written to people who are born again. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. So you see who the letter was written to. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, give me King James Version. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So the book of Ephesians is written to the saints. It's written to those in Christ. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 2. So you know who these letters are written to. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. In Christ. Which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is not talking to everybody. This is talking to Christians. So he's saying here, the wife is subject to her husband as the church is subject to Christ. If you go on Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, Ephesians chapter 5, 28 and 29, King James Version. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Next verse. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. So it lets you know that the body is the wife. The head is the husband. Look at verse 33 of that same Ephesians chapter 5. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. The wife see that she reverence or respects. Give me the, the amplified of verse 33. Please pay attention. Verse 33, amplified version. However, let each of you, without exception, love his wife as being in a sense his very own self. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband. That she notices him, regards him honors him, prefers him, venerates, and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves, and oh, I love this translation, and loves and admires him exceedingly. In fact, throughout this series, we shall be reading Amplified. The Bible never asks the woman to love the husband. The woman has no assignment of loving. Don't bother. The man is to love. You are to submit. Don't be loving me when you should be submitting. Now I'm not talking to mama. Mama submits to me. We are very happy. We don't have a problem. You can see. Her. She's a wonderful woman. Yes. Sir. Next year will be 30 years. 30 years married. 30 years married. Not Christians. 30 years married as Christians. We're happy. We don't have problems. If I have problem, you will know it in my messages. <laughs> I'll come here and say, God punish you. <laughs> if you don't fear the Lord, you will see hellfire. 
<laughs> when, a, when a pastor is not happy to show in his messages. Uh, we are happy. You know. I'm excited. And that's why we want all the marriages in Power City to be happy homes. Both in the headquarters, in the branches, all over the world. We don't want to have marriages that are full of t- tension, wahala, breakdown. No, 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 no. That's what we're teaching. This teaching is vaccination against uh, marriage virus. <laughs> amen. <clears throat> I said amen. Okay, so God never said the woman should love the husband. That's where may, many women have problems. Instead of a woman submitting to her husband, she's busy loving him. Darling, I love you. I love you. I love you. If I didn't love you, eh? I love you. The man is hungry. You are shouting, I love you. I love you. Darling, I love you. I've just sent for ice cream for you. Just be patient. It's coming. Ice cream in the afternoon. African man. Ice cream. No. Don't be loving. Don't be loving him. Just submit. Your submission is the language that you use in loving him. If there's anything like that. But the husband is the man to love. We will get there next Sunday, but let's stay. Today is for women, so let's leave men first. I love my husband. That does not keep the marriage. I love my husband. That does not keep the home. That's why many marriages are broken. And the wife is still crying. I really love my husband, though. It's just that we couldn't stay together. That's why the home scattered. Because you were loving a wife is supposed to submit. Loving your husband doesn't keep your home. It is respect and honor and reverence for your husband that keeps your home. Respect, honor, reverence. That's what keeps your home. Please listen carefully. Young girls that are planning to marry, hear me well. Loving your husband doesn't keep your home. It is respect, honor, and reverence to your husband that keeps your home. You are supposed to submit to him in love. We will see that later. But the key ingredient is submission. You are a wife or you are going to be one. You need to understand the word of God about marriage. You need to understand. And I'm going to speak to singles in a bit. There's no instruction in the word of God for wives to love their husbands. The instruction is to submit. Be submissive to your husband. There's no point going for a long-term marriage counseling. You are wasting your time and our time. There's, those instructions are plain. Those instructions are simple. They don't take 10 hours. Just read it. Wives... Submit yourself to your own husbands in everything. Talking to Christians. Simple. Reverence him, honor him, respect him. Case closed. There will be no tension. There will be no tension. There will be no wahala. There will be no problem. Now. But many of us are gone to school. And this is where we need to renew our mind. As a woman, you need to renew your mind, especially if you're in, you were in class with the boys and you were taking number one, they were taking number 20. You are trashing the boys in your class with intelligence. And then after that, when you compete with them, you beat them hands down. You argue with them and you defeat them. And you look at them and tell them, don't be silly. Don't be stupid. And they tell you, I'm sorry. And even when your husband wanted to marry you, he had to beg you. Please, darling, I beg you. If you don't marry me, I will die. So you have that air of superiority. And you grew with that mindset. Where you see every man obeying you and submitting to you. And to make matters worse, you work in an office where men are under you. You are their boss. Come here. Go out. Stop that. I'm sorry, ma. I'm sorry, ma. Then you come home. And your husband says, where is my food? You say, sit down, my friend. You know where I'm coming from? I've been walking since morning. 
<laughs> that house no go stand. Though. <laughs> that house will not stand. So you need to renew your mind. Especially if you want to remain married. You need to renew your mind. Because you can't continue with that mindset in a marriage. And today, you, you know the way they, uh, they apply to women for marriage. You go to supermarket. You carry ring in your pocket. Then in the midst of crowd, you kneel down. Please, can you marry me? Nonsense. Total nonsense. That's not marriage. That's showmanship. Man is kneeling down in the market to beg a girl to marry him. That's no more marriage. That's no more marriage. <laughs> if you were planning to, if I catch you, you are a member of the, if I catch you, you will know that I'm your spiritual father. <laughs> Amen. You are in this world. You are not of this world. So now you are married to that man. You need to renew your mind. The Bible never makes marriage a compulsory relationship for anybody. You must not marry. You must not marry. Once you discover that you cannot submit to a man. Please don't marry. The Bible gives you the right to live as a single person forever. You don't have to. But once you decide to marry, make up your mind to submit. Once you decide, it's not by force. But if you must marry, then as a woman, you must bring down yourself to a place of submission because that is your honoring the Lord and that is your service to Jesus. Marriage is a choice. Not getting married does not mean you are not fulfilled. You can be fulfilled without a husband. You can be fulfilled without a wife. You can live a good life. There are a lot of single people that are living better than some married people. Am I talking here? Marriage where a woman is pursuing a man in the bush with matchet. Is that a marriage? I know one that used to be in this church. One guy got married in this church, beat his wife and took out her eyes and was using stick to bring her to church because she was blind. He will bring her and sit down with her. Now you, he blinded her two eyes. He himself cannot be free now because he has to lead the blind. So two of them are trapped. That's not a marriage. That's not a marriage. Why must you marry? You must know why you must marry. Abi? Because when something does not have a purpose, a views is inevitable. You don't, hey, listen everybody. You don't have to marry. There's no scripture that say if you don't marry, you will not make heaven. There's no scripture that say if you don't marry, you are a half human being. You don't have to. Marriage is a choice. And don't let anybody intimidate you and say, if you don't marry, there are favors you cannot get. Because he that finds a wife, finds a good thing and obtains favor. When you marry, there are doors that will open to you. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. You are not complete until you are married. There's this blessing that comes with marriage. Those are motivational speakers. Don't listen to them. 1 Corinthians 7 34. Mm -mm. I'm blessing you. 1 Corinthians 7 34. Give me the King James first. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. A virgin is a lady that is not married. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. The unmarried woman, please follow this. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord 
that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. How she may please her husband. You know, some ladies are not married, but they are married. Some ladies are not married, but they are married. They are caring for a man that they are hoping to marry them. You understand? They are caring for a man that they are hoping to marry them. So they are already caring for a man. A responsibility for the married. Instead of caring for the Lord. They are caring for a man. They take their salary and give him. They cook and bring for him. He tells them, any woman I will marry, I have to taste her food first. If I don't taste her food, I will not marry her. So three women are bringing food to his house. He is eating free of charge. Three square meals. One in the morning, another woman in the afternoon, another in the evening. Wicked man. Any woman that I don't eat her food, I cannot marry her. They are busy bringing food three times a day. The man is eating free of charge. Say, please, the afternoon food is coming late. Time is important in the decision. The food must arrive before one o'clock. <laughs> Stupid girl. Stupid girl. Stupid girl. What did I say? Stupid girl. There's a lady that took care of one guy that used to be my friend for seven years. Seven, mama knows. Seven years. She was cooking and bringing. Every morning on her way to work, she would drop bag of food. Every evening on her way from back work, she would drop dinner. Serving, serving like a slave for seven years. And at the seventh year, the man went to Lagos for the first time in his life. When he arrived Lagos, he saw this is Lagos. And he forgot the girl. She, the day he wrote her and told her, my, my dear, please let this not be a surprise. I have decided to move on. Send me a calculation of your investment on my life. I will refund. She fell down and collapsed. They took her to hospital. It took time to resuscitate her. She died. Some of you girls are following a man for three years. He has not explained anything. Three years. No explanation. You are a fool. You are a fool. Fool. Some of you girls, your problem is you have no self-esteem. Number two, you are, you are suffering from identity crisis. Number three, you, you, don't, you don't believe in yourself. You don't believe in what Christ has done. You believe that only a man can complete. I will soon reach singles. Let me continue with wives. Let me continue with wives. You're cooking for a man who is not your husband. When you should be caring for the things of the Lord. Meanwhile, you don't come for prayer meeting. You don't come for prayer cruise. Evangelism, you are not there. Discipleship, you are not there. But you are serving a man that has not approached you. Thinking that with food, you will compel him to marry you. Because they told you in your village that the way to a man's heart is his mouth. Or his stomach. Okay. Village proverbs. Rather than enjoy your singleness. Enjoy being single. Make the most of it. Serve God. Live out a fulfilled life. Pursue career. Achieve the things you should achieve as a single person. You are busy chasing a boy around. The married cares for the things of the world. How she may please her husband. So the woman who is the wife will seek to please her husband. Please underline the word please. If you are making notes as a woman, write that please in capital letters. P-L-E-A-S-E. -E. Please, her husband. Remember, we are talking about believers. Respect. Respect. 
goes into how you treat your husband. Respect goes into how you call your husband. Respect goes into how you speak to your husband, both in his presence and in his absence. How you call him, how you treat him, how you speak to him in his presence and in his absence. All that is a definition of respect, which is honor. You know, today we have, like I said, lovely names. Sugar, sweetheart, baby. You're calling a full-grown man, baby. <laughs> he will soon collect a bottle from you. Very lovely pet names. But we have to be careful because we don't want to get into the worldly way of doing things. Before sweetheart, before sugar, before pepper, before salt, is head. The Bible definition for a husband is head. Head. My head. That is the way God sees a husband and a wife. The husband is head. What God cares is his own instructions. You can't modify God's instruction. You only align. What is God's instruction for a wife as it relates to her acknowledging her husband as head? My head. Not sweetie. My head. It is after you call head, you can add sweetie. Head sweetie. Head baby. <laughs> head pepper. <laughs> head mosquito. <laughs> but it first of all has to be head. That's what honors God. When a woman calls her husband my head, it gives God honor. Because that's what the word of God teaches. Don't say I like that couple. You know they are friends. The wife can just tell the husband, are you mad? Are you silly? Idiot. And the husband will say, thank you, ma. That's a bad model. They are not honoring God. They are not honoring God. You have to act on the word. Your commitment should be to the word as a woman. Your commitment should be to the word, not to your husband, to the word. When you're committed to the word, you, that commitment will affect your husband. Your commitment should be to the word, not to your husband. And when you're committed to the word, the word will streamline how you treat your husband. The word will streamline how you respond. The word will streamline how you treat him. So your commitment is primarily to the word as a woman. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter now begins to speak to those who coincidentally got married to unbelievers as unbelievers. 1 Peter 3 1. Mm -mm. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Give me the king, the amplified. Amplified version of 1 Peter 3. In like manner, you married women. Be submissive to your own husband. Subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent on them and adapt yourselves to them so that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over not by discussion but by the godly lives of their wives. Not by discussion but by the godly lives of their wives. Not by discussion. Why did he use likewise? Because he had previously said in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25, that was the thing he said before he said likewise. 1 Peter 2 25, for you were going astray like so many sheep, but now you have come back to the shepherd and guardian, the bishop of your souls. Then the next verse, likewise, likewise ye wives that are now born again, the overseer of your souls. Have you observed that everything he mentions, every time he mentions wives, he said to your own husbands. Your own. 
That's why a man you cannot respect, don't marry him. The moment somebody says, I want to marry you as a woman, the first thing you ask yourself is, can I respect this man? Can I submit to this man? Can I call this guy my Lord? If inside you feel no, tell him to go. Tell him, because that marriage will not work. That's the first thing you ask yourself. Can, is this the kind of person I want to be my head? Those are the questions you ask yourself. The scripture says a lot about the behavior of the wife at home. It's a major issue in, in the New Testament. The behavior of a wife at home. Look at that first Peter, chapter 3, verse 2. Look at the amplified of verse 2 of that same Peter. <clears throat> when they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves, together with your reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him. All that reverence includes to respect, defer to, revere him, to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, to adore him, that is, to admire, praise, be devoted, I just love this amplifier, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. Go, wait, wait, let me go over it again. Women, are you here? Okay, let me read so you hear. Don't be loving us, eh? Yeah, don't say I love you my husband you are to feel for him and all that reverence includes you can make a list if you like respect defer to revere him honor esteem appreciate prize and in the human sense adore him admire Praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. If a woman does this, even if her husband is demonized, that marriage will continue. That home will be good. Because that's what Peter was saying. Now. Even if the husband is not a believer, even if the husband is an evil person, even if the husband is an occultist, these are the things a woman will do and win him. He said, don't discuss. Don't be quoting Bible for him. Let your behavior be the quotation. Let him be reading, for God so loved the world in your behavior. Everybody is quiet. Did you see secondary did you see that the wife is secondary? Eh? He didn't say women are secondary. He said the wife is secondary. Not women. The wife is a secondary tool. Look at verse 3. Amplified. Verse 3. First, yeah. Let not yours be the merely external adorning with elaborate interweaving and knotting Brazilian hair, German hair, Jamaican hair. Eh? Is there a Nigerian one? Now? The wearing of jewelry or changes of clothes. Don't use all those things because they will not work. <laughs> they won't work. Fashion, they won't work. Don't use them. Because you can't do those things in that list and keep malice with your husband. You can't admire him, honor him, adore him, reverence him, feel for him and keep malice. A woman keeping malice with her husband is not doing these things because you can't, those, you can't do the two. Are we in the building? You can't. You can't do the two and keep malice. Looking beautiful is not how you keep your home. Attaching bum bum to your bum bum is not enough to keep your home. Because if you are not careful, the thing will misplace. 
You know what I'm talking about now. Attaching boobs to your boobs is not enough. Because it can shift. And when it shifts, you'll, you'll be doing like this as you're walking. And it will look like ant is biting you. <laughs> All that is not going to work. Because it, when you get home, the thing will, you will remove it. I've told you the story of the people who got married in Ghana. A pastor. He married a woman that didn't have breasts. They amputated her breast. So she put at fish hour. And she didn't tell him she had that fish her breast. After they got married and got home, remove your clothes. No, she said, No, ah, we can't be removing clothes fast now. Wait. She's thinking of how to keep deceiving the man. But the man too cannot wait for too long. So reality done. The man said, Ah, oh God, why have you done like this to me? It's not God that did like that to you, bro. It's the woman. The, the marriage is scattered that same day. Because there's no marriage. It was deception. There was no marriage at all. She thought because we preach no divorce. So after she just get him to marry her, that would be the end. No. There's no marriage because there's deception. Marriage only exists on the truth. I'm teaching here. So attaching this, attaching this, attaching that is not going to keep a home. What will keep a home without attachment is respect. Honor. Esteem your husband. Revere him. Respect him. Honor him. Celebrate him. Feel for him. Those adjectives are the adjectives that will keep any home. Any in any society, under any culture, those are the adjectives that will keep any home. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Sexual relationship is a secondary action. Sex is not enough to keep a marriage. It's a secondary action. The Bible never teaches you to keep your home with sexual relationship. It's one of the responsibilities in marriage, quite all right, but it's not enough to keep a marriage. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. Mm -mm. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. The wife had not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. Verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent. For a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Incont con All right? So, the way you act in marriage as a woman is your submission, your conduct. The way you act towards your husband, how you treat your husband. He says, it's not about clothes. You see the movies. Movie stars, they spend a fortune to buy clothes. To buy gold, to buy jewelry. And they get married after seven days, they scatter. It doesn't last. Because the marriage itself was a movie. Some of them, you see them dress. Fashion stars. They move like they never go to toilet. Everything is sparkling. But yet they cannot keep a home. They cannot keep a home. Why can they not keep a home? Because everything for them is movie and acting. It's never reality. And if you ask the lady, how are you? What's your name? She says, well, I am Mrs. John, formerly Mrs. James, formerly Mrs. Darrell, formerly Mrs. Ebenezer. <laughs> That's, she, this is the fourth marriage. So it's not beauty. Young woman, make the change. Grow up. Grow up. Make up your mind that I'm going to marry and anybody I'm married to, I will submit to. You've got to make that decision right now. Because that is what will glorify God. That is what will glorify God. The way you just open your mouth and talk carelessly. <clears throat> you have to learn to act on the word. There's no anointing on the wedding day that will change a woman. So when you start relating and the woman is behaving funny, stop it. There is no anointing that will come on the wedding and change her. When you start interfacing for marriage and you observe certain behaviors, challenge them. Don't 
pretend. Don't say, I know by faith she will change. Your faith cannot change somebody. And I'm sure I've taught you in this church, there is no one will of God for, uh, for marriage, right? I've taught that before. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it when I get into singles. Look at verse 4 of that Peter. I love that Peter. Give me the amplified of that Peter. <clears throat> Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 3 verse 4. First Peter chapter 3 verse number 4. <clears throat> Is it second? First. But let it be the inward adorning and beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit. When a woman is gentle, she will enjoy her marriage. Gentle woman. Not... <laughs> fight neighbors. Fight outsiders. Fight by water tap. Collect their bucket. Break it. Scatter everywhere. No gentleness. No humility. Fight in the market. Fight on the road. Anytime your husband hears noise, his heart is beating because he is thinking you are the one there. The moment they say, two fighting, two fighting. Oh, father. Oh, heart attack is coming. <laughs> Glory to God. Gentle women always enjoy their marriage. Women, commit yourselves to the word. Commit to the word. If the word of God can change you, it can change somebody else. Act on the word. Let's see the word of God and its life manifested through you. So anyone that is married to a non-Christian, this is your cure now. St. Peter, verse 5. 1 Peter 3, 5, amplified. For it was those that the pious women of old who hoped in God were accustomed to beautify themselves and were submissive to their husbands, adapting themselves to them as to, to them as themselves secondary and dependent upon them. The women of old. The women of old. Those are our models. The women of old. Not Nollywood women. Not Hollywood women. Not Bollywood women. But the women of old. Those are the models for Christian women. Because marriage is old. Look at verse 6. Amplified. Verse 6. Amplified. It was thus that Sarah obeyed Abraham following his guidance and acknowledging his headship over her by calling him Lord, Master, Leader, Authority. And you are now her true daughters. If you do right... And let nothing terrify you, not giving way to hysterical fears or letting anxieties unnerve you. You become the daughters of Sarah when you model after her. So our models are women of old and our mothers in the church who are exemplary. Not some fashion star. Kardashians. No. The Bible says women of old. Not Maria Carey. Women of old. Who call their husbands. My lord. Master. Leader. My authority. Some women won't like what I'm teaching. Some women as I'm teaching. Their tummy is turning. It's just that they can't be going to the toilet every five minutes. So they are gathering the toilet. So that when I finish they will release it. <laughs> thing is turning them because many women when they hear the word submit it is like you are telling them bleed but if you don't want to submit 
Live alone. I beg you. Live alone. It's not a sin. Live alone. And be happy. Because when you live alone, you have nobody to answer to. Only God. Answer to God and answer to your pastor in church. Finish. The two responsibility. Go out when you like. Come back when you like. Spend your money the way you like. Eat the way you like. If you like, leave your house dirty. If you like, clean it. Nobody will ask you. If you like, cook. When you don't like, don't cook. But once you're married, you come into a place of submission. So these are the two different lives. The choice is yours. But if you're already married, you have no choice. <laughs> Sorry. That's the Bible instruction to the married. You must be submissive. Your model should be old women in the Bible whom we read about and the mothers in the church whose lives are exemplary. Submission starts from the premarital relationships that you keep. Acting on the word starts from there. Like I said, you don't start calling a man that has not married you, my Lord. But of course, as you begin to relate, you can tell if this man is the kind of person I want to submit to. And you too can tell if this kind of woman can submit. You can tell as you begin to relate without cooking for him and bringing food morning, afternoon, evening. Every one of God's children can submit because the fruit of the spirit is gentleness, meekness. And you learn from a single lady to be submissive. As a single lady, you start submitting from your father's house. You submit to your mother. You submit to your father. When your mother gives you instruction, you will be her. That's where you learn submission from. You learn submission from your parents. When they speak to you, you take their words. When they rebuke you, you take it in good faith. Not that you're a single girl, your parents are rebuking you, you're pouting all over the house. Mm, because I'm still in this house. Very soon I'll be gone, sir. You come and talk to me like that. What are you doing? Nothing. You know, you're pouting all over the house. Just because you were rebuked or scolded. That is a sign of how you would do with your husband. Your husband will tell you, I don't like the way you behave. You see how you eat food today. You're not going to cook food. I will warm for you yesterday morning's food. You will eat yesterday morning's food. No new food. <laughs> I will warm it for you. That rice I cooked last Friday, I will warm it now. For talking to you. <laughs> Should I close? <laughs> Praise God. Are women secondary? No. Women are not secondary, but wives are. Women are not secondary, but wives are. Because a wife only submits to one person. And she's secondary to that person. But women are not secondary. In their place of work, women are better than some men. Women are better than some men. They can do better than some men. So they are not secondary. But in, in the home, a wife is secondary. The husband is the head. Who is a wife? A woman in a marriage. You are not a wife in your office. You are not a wife on your job. You are not a wife in your business. You're only a wife in your home. So don't go to your office and be treating your husband, your, your boss like your husband and say, Bible says I should submit. Eh, eh, that's misplaced. In your office, you are as equal to everybody. You do your job well. Don't take shit from anybody. Do what you need to do. If anybody is not supposed to instruct you, instruct you, tell him stop that. You don't have the right to do that. And walk away. Because you are not subservient to anybody. You have equal rights with everybody in that office. But once you come home, you remove office cloth. You put inside box. You wear wife's cloth. My master. What can I make for you? 
Pound the yam, gari apple. <laughs> Say more. Oh, what do you want? I was going to say, I don't want the, the food hot. Yes, sir. I bring it warm. No, don't make it warm. Make it semi-warm. Yes, sir. You go and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive anointing for semi-warm. <laughs> a man that will ask his wife to bring food semi-warm must be a very difficult man. More difficult than me. <laughs> I know I can be difficult, but I've never asked for semi-warm. <laughs> Not warm, semi-warm, and not cold. Say, how do we measure? <laughs> praise God. I said, praise God. Can you imagine someone telling my wife, don't wear trousers? I will remove your eye. When I remove your eye, I will pray for a miracle of replacement. What? How did you see my wife? How? I asked her to wear trousers. Because I want to see her in trouser. Why? Because the married woman must please her husband. Her dressing is not your responsibility. It's my responsibility. And her dressing is not directed to you. It's directed to me. If you saw it, your eyes went to the wrong place. Put your eyes straight, my friend. Her dressing is for me, not for you. Is it a settled matter? If I want my wife on mini skirt in my house, I will ask her, wear it. If you see, now you're wahala. She's not for you to see. Whatever I want, I have my wife to wear it because she's there for my pleasure. So every woman dresses to please her husband. That's the Bible. That's the way the Bible teaches it. Even if she doesn't like the dress, if her husband likes it, she has to wear it. Because she's there to please the man. I'm teaching here. I'm teaching here. Our homes will be the best on it. So take what I'm teaching you because the Bible is a book of all wisdom. Praise God. The new creation in marriage is submissive. The women, women in this building, say these words with me very loud. I have the spirit of God. The, spirit of God. Ah, the women are not answering me. <laughs> they are giving me meditation voice. Oh, spirit of God. <laughs> Let me hear you very loud. Online women, power city branches and campuses all over the world. Let all the women say with me very loud. I have the spirit of God. I, spirit of God. I am what the word says I am. I am submissive. Submission is a fruit of my spirit. I don't act worldly. I act on the world. I am born of the world. I do the world. That's the word of God. Wives, be submissive. Be respectful. He says, fear your husband. Fear your husband. Some women talk when the husband is there. How can you be talking? Me, I'm there and you're talking. Oh, I asked two of you question, you and your husband, and you start answering. You are not honoring Christ. You are a disgrace to Christ. A woman is not supposed to utter a word when her husband is there. Even if the husband is a fool, for marrying him, she is the wife of a fool. She must operate like a fool. Since you submitted and agreed to call a fool, my Lord. That's the end of the matter. Even if he embarrasses you, you must grow to where the embarrassment becomes pleasure. So when he's fooling around, you are smiling. <laughs> the best man on earth. This man is correct. You see that he is doing. That's why I married him. You have to. You have to. There are no other ways. That's the way you honor Jesus. For accepting the foolish things he does. Because you saw it before you married him. And you were happy to be with him. So nothing should change. Praise God. 
I'm painting pictures because I want single ladies to see well. If you're a Christian woman, when you're talking somewhere and your husband comes in, keep quiet. If you're talking and your husband enters, stop the discourse. Stop. If they ask the question again, do like you don't know what they are talking about. Let your husband talk. And if your husband says what is different from yours, say, I'm sorry, what I said before, this is the best, this is what I actually wanted to say. My husband has just put it right. This is just, you know, my husband, he has a way of explaining it better. This is exactly what I meant. Then re-echo what he said and re-emphasize it. And stand by it. Even if that thing will punish two of you, so let it be. <laughs> Go home and be punished. <laughs> when you are being punished, be telling him, you see what you have caused for us? <laughs> well, I'm just honoring Christ by following you to suffer. Next time, please think before you answer this kind of this. <laughs> As we are suffering like this. I don't like it, Jesus. It was you I was honoring. Deliver us from this suffering. Uh, Jesus will deliver you. You can never be wrong obeying your husband. Even when he makes mistakes, the grace of God will help you. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I've made some mistakes as a husband. There, I think it's last week on I don't know, it's last week or so. We were talking and I said to my wife, because she, she reminded me of some, some decision I made that didn't turn out really well. And then I now said to her, but honey, you know, even though I've made wrong decisions in, in certain things in our lives, but at the end of the day, I have never led us into the bush. She said, true. She said, very true. Very, very true. I have no regrets whatsoever marrying you. He said, because you've never, even when you make mistakes, somehow, somehow, God has a way of turning the whole thing around to be good. I said, because I am the head of this house. And your submitting to me makes the, the flow of grace in this family to take care of mistakes that I have made. But if the wife decides for the man, there is no grace for the wife deciding for the family. The grace of that home is on the man deciding. I don't know if you understand. Are you all hearing me? <laughs> you are looking at me like this. Yes. The wife has to follow the husband's decision. He's ahead. He's ahead. It's so important. Very important. Treat your husband first. Make him know that he's number one. When people come to visit your office and your husband enters, stand up. My husband has arrived. Let everybody know your husband has come. Not the one your husband come and he's standing outside and he's calling your phone. Uh, darling, darling, I'm here. Say, wait, now don't you know I'm in the office? Wait. The man is under the sun. Darling, I've waited for five minutes now. Say, ah. I am working. You came to my office. Don't be waiting there. I will soon come. No. Even if you are busy, take permission. God say, honey, what is it? Or darling, what is it? Oh, okay. I've heard. Thank you. Thank you. You can go. I will take care of it. You go back. Oh, sorry. It was my husband. I needed to attend to something. Don't be ashamed to announce it was my husband. In the world, they respect women who respect their husbands. The entire world respects women who respect their husbands. If you go to your family with your husband and they bring food, serve your husband first. Don't serve your father. Serve your husband first. Your father is there, but you have left him. Serve your husband first. After you serve your husband, you can serve your uncles and everybody else. You know, we used to go to the village with mama. And when we go to the house, she'll be serving me first. I'll be feeling uncomfortable. I will look around. <laughs> then I will tell her, give other people. You say, eat your own now. Eat your own. Don't worry. Others will be taken care of. I will still be looking. <laughs> the moment they bring food, she will just bring my own. I will tell her, why are you making them look like I am always hungry? She said, no. <laughs> Mama will say, no. It is the right thing to do. I am your wife. Eat. Let me take care of you first. I will take care of others. I said, boy, he's making it look like I am the first person that is hungry here. <laughs> 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 
But I'm not the first person that is hungry. It's just that. <laughs> praise God. I say praise God. I say praise God. That is the word of God to a married woman. Can everybody say with me, I am what the word says I am. I'm a new creation. Now all the women say, I have the spirit of submission. It's not difficult for me to submit to authority. I am submissive to, a, to authority. Can I have a good amen? That's a Christian woman. A Christian woman is not a showbiz woman. A Christian woman is not a fashion star. A Christian woman is not Nollywood, Hollywood. She is Christian wood. She's Christ wood. She's Christ wood. She doesn't take all her influences from star, fashion stars, Hollywood. No, no. She takes her influences from Christ, from his word, and from the standard of God's word. She acts on the word. She keeps the right friends. She keeps the right friends. She does not say, how can I be the one cooking morning, afternoon, evening for my husband? Can't he cook? No. Let your husband be the one who willingly says, darling, go and sit down. Let me cook for you. Not you the one. Tell him, cook. Cook. Can't you cook? Don't you know there are men that cook? Cook. Cook. The Bible doesn't say the husband is the cook. The Bible says the husband is the head. And a Christian woman will do what is right. Cook for your husband. Give him food at the right time. Don't punish him with food. Because there are women that punish their husbands with food. I have not eaten. <laughs> you have not eaten. <laughs> when did you give me money last? <laughs> you have not eaten. <laughs> you have not eaten. <laughs> Uh, you remember the shoe I told you I want to buy? That shoe. We have to buy it. See, I say I have not eaten. When did you give me money last? I asked you for pocket money three weeks ago. You gave me 5,000. It finished last week. The one you ate yesterday was from my, my money I kept. So if you want us to eat, bring money, I will go to market now. Uh -uh. So you go to market before it? Yes, now because there's nothing. The man will now struggle to find money. Then you will go to market and punish him. Meanwhile, there is food inside your box. You just want to punish him. It's not a Christian behavior. It's not. It's not. There are women who behave like that. I know what I'm talking about. You know how many people I have counseled in my life? I know what I'm talking about. See, Papa, there was food. I was just hiding it. Because that man, that man, when he gives money, we don't know the next time he will give. So we hide it, let him bring another money in case he changes his mind later. A Christian woman doesn't behave like that. Amen. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. So with me, I'm submissive to my husband. Praise God. I say praise God. Stand on your feet, that's all I got for you. Great service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next Sunday we shall face husbands. Don't worry. We started with wives first. So that when we come to husbands, we can continue. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, thank you for the privilege of learning. We do the word, we act the word, we live the word. The word lives through us. So I pray for every woman in this service, every married woman, every single lady, and all the ladies that are planning to get married. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. I ask that grace abound to us all our wives, grace abound to us all our single ladies, and grace abound to us all our young ladies. In the name of Jesus. We decree that anyone that is 
any woman here that is in a marriage where she is not happy that some of the things we have taught today her eyes be open to see exactly what to do to turn her marriage around in the name of Jesus and we pray for single ladies that are, are ready to get married but they are yet to find somebody to marry them we pray that this will be a season of, of, of miracle, miracle connections where marriage is concerned in the name of Jesus supernatural relationships supernatural favors and supernatural connections between single guys and single ladies at this time within this ministry in the name of Jesus and we silence the voice of the enemy we rebuke everything that is contrary we pray for any marriage that is going through turbulence that this will be healing for that marriage in the name of Jesus and we rejoice Lord that your word rules in our hearts rules in our minds and your word makes us the best that it has ever seen uh, has ever seen and we give you praise in this place that grace is multiplied through the knowledge of your word in Jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality I didn't hear that amen like thunder if you're blessed shout I do the word I'm born of the word I live out the word I didn't hear a good amen grab a good offering let's give in honor of God's word in honor of God's word when you hear this word, you honor the word with your giving. Your giving enables us to do more, enables us to get the word out to more people, enable more people to come to the knowledge of the truth of God's word. So, I'd like everybody to grab an offering online. The banking details are there. On television, the banking details are there. Radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush will read the banking details to you in the next two or three minutes before we begin Ask the Counselor. But it's an honor to serve you the grace of God. All our campuses around the world, it's time to give your honor offering. Grab your honor offering all over the world. Let's pray. Lift it up to heaven, Father. We give in faith. We give with joy our offerings. We, we, we thank you for the privilege of honoring your word and honoring what Christ has done. I ask that as we give, the blessing is upon everyone. Needs are met supernaturally. Desires are granted. And we thank you for the privilege of giving today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. 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 Now listen to me, online community. Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. I continue this teaching. And like I said, next Sunday, first and second service, we'll be addressing husbands. So make sure all our husbands are in church next Sunday, first and second service. So everybody is enriched and everybody is giving instructions in righteousness so that all of us can be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We love you. Thank you always for giving me the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. And don't forget tomorrow evening, Tuesday evening, we keep teaching at 6 p.m. But Wednesday, I will continue on relationships. And until we see you again, enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service this morning. Glory! Amen! Woo! Glory! Message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damino, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.
A moment as you continue to stand with me, let me just take out, especially a radio audience, through the opening announcements I always gave at this stage of the program. Bank details, the account name Power City International, there are three banks, FCMB is number one, Zenith is number two, and UBA is number three. Sometimes the last becomes the first, so we go UBA 139-26-465, UBA 139-26-465, Power City International, the same for FCMB 2982-68-2028. 29, 82, 68, 20, 28, Power City International. And finally, Zenith now, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12. That is announcement number one. Announcement number two, uh, we're preparing the grounds for something very massive, for another massive platform. So if you want to sponsor, you want to support in any way or two, call plus 234-803-275-61. Oh, four, and then, of course, email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. The doctor there is simply D. R. Okay, the stage is set. Global Bar joins me now. My name is Michael Bush. My production team, give them a round of applause, please. And now, for this wonderful teacher of the word, never seen anyone teach like him. I thought you just put those hands together for him. An international radio and televangelist. Prolific author, Global Baba, Dr. Abel Damina. Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. How Good nice to see you. Here. Praise How God. nice to see you, Global Baba. Wow. How do you feel? Very powerful. Global Baba. Very blessed. All of those prayers. Charged and edified. <laughs> Ready to answer questions. Okay, Global Baba, please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start from a far field as the United States of America. Blessings, Dr. Abel Damina. I salute you from Clayton, North Carolina, in the United States of America. This is Prophet Sammy Rodriguez. We met a few years ago in Aqua Ibom in Nigeria. We're actually riding on the same plane. I was holding a crusade in Nigeria. We took a picture together at the airport. I just wanted to say that your ministry has suddenly transformed and changed my life to recognize my identity in Christ and what Christ can do through me. I've been highly impacted, Global Baba. My ministry has been raised to another level in Christ Jesus. I've been really ministering around the nations, especially the Spanish community, and bringing this treasure of the riches of God to the preaching of the gospel. And people have been touched greatly. Global Baba, I've been in ministry full-time for 10 years, but since I met you two years ago, I've come to understand what true ministry is all about. I thank you so much, sir. Apart from this, I would like to know if there's an accredited schooling that I can take under your ministry. That should be an accredited school. Any associate bachelor's or master's degree that I can have in my hand by going through your school. What would it take for me to come under a genuine Christ-like ministry such as yours? What can I do? How can we go about starting this right now, Global Baba? We spoke on the phone some two years ago when I was preaching in Europe. I would love to hear your voice again and be part of what God is doing in and through you. I would love for you to be my spiritual father. Well, Global Baba, you're already my father by default, he writes and concludes. I also would like to thank you so much and I'd love to hear from you, Prophet Sammy Rodriguez. Global Baba, just hold your thoughts on this as I join my first caller. Hello. Hello. Yeah, welcome to our show. Your name, where are you calling from? Yes, sir. I'm calling from Qatar. 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 Is Kennedy. Qatar. Okay. Go ahead, Kennedy. Yeah, I want to acknowledge my beloved father, the global Baba himself. We are so blessed for the new service. We love him. We want to appreciate him. Thank you. Thank you. So, Baba, my question is that uh, Jesus is the attractor of deity and, and humanity. So the question is, if, Ma if Mary the first born again because she was pregnant with, with the deity in her own, when the incarnation took place, she was pregnant with the first deity, was she the first born again? That is, was Mary born again when she got pregnant with Jesus? Is that the question? Was she the first born person to be born again? 
No, she was not. Even when she got pregnant and carried Jesus, she was still not born again. She only got born again because nobody was born again before Jesus died. Jesus is the first begotten, the prototokos, the prototype. He was the first to be born again as a model for all others. Mary got born again in the process along with the other disciples. And that is why on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 verse 11 to 14, Mary was with them in the, in the upper room and she was with them in Solomon's porch when the Holy Ghost came and all of them spoke in tongues. So yes, she got born again. But she was not the first. Jesus is the first to be born again. He's the first begotten from the dead. Hope that helps. We come back to those calls. And indeed, let me also tell the audience. We have a huge, large audience here. We have a huge um, live audience. So just prepare. I'll take three questions from you as we progress. But group over, let's go back to Sammy Rodriguez. Yes, Sammy, bless you. And it's so nice to hear from you. And I'm excited about what you're doing among the Spanish community big time. Our programs, our Bible school programs are undergoing accreditation right now. When they are through, then we'll be able to offer diplomas, degrees, and all of that. But they are not through with accrediting our courses. They are still undergoing. But I'll make sure I get back to you either by call or by email. But thank you for calling in. And I'm glad to know that you're making impact in that part of the world. Okay, from that part of the United States, let's get to another one. This one says, Sir... I'm based in the USA. I'm a pastor. I'm a strong follower of your teachings, but I have questions about resurrection, which others refer to as rapture. The issue of trumpet, global barba, and mortality, putting on mortality, can you please explain better how this would be? One, will there be the sound of real trumpet for resurrection to take place? Two, and when we resurrect as a cloud with Jesus, what next, global barba? And lastly, if there is any of your materials or teachings on this, kindly let me know so I could study better. Thanks for your response, sir. Thank you for reaching out. Yes, I have a material that will help you. It's a book I wrote. It's titled The Last Days. It's a book on eschatology. That will help you a lot with that information. And I have another teaching, audio teaching, understanding the book of Revelation. But yeah, rapture is a concept that theologians coin to explain immortality, swallowing mortality. So when mortality is swallowed by immortality, the Bible says we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what will happen? The word cloud there is not cloud like rain cloud. The word cloud there is all of us that will rise together with Jesus. Human beings are called cloud in the Bible. It's a figure of speech. All right. So all of us will be the cloud with Jesus. And the Bible tells us we will ever be with the Lord. That's the next thing that will happen, to be with Jesus forever. Okay, so from United States Global Baba, we move to Spain. And this one simply says, please, my counselor, explain to me John 13, 3 to 14. Please, sir, is it a doctrinal practice as some are doing, the washing of feet? I'm Elvis Otete in Spain. John chapter 13, verse 3 to 14, as a matter of fact. 3 to 14, okay. Long one. Let me quickly mention, it's not a practice, it's not a doctrinal practice. So any church that says you should wash feet as a doctrinal practice because there's something about it, you are being misled. It's not true. Jesus was teaching his disciples exemplarily how to serve one another. And so when he took the bucket and the water, he was just, you know, communicating by parables to them how that those that want to be great in the kingdom will have to be the ones to serve. He wasn't literally talking about washing legs. He was talking about service. If you read the pretext and the post-text of that whole thing, Jesus was communicating service. That's why no apostle wash anybody's feet. No apostle in the entire New Testament because it's not a doctrinal practice. So if anybody asks you to go around washing people's legs, he's trying to get you into, into a fetish operation. It has no scriptural backing and it is not right. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, verse 4, he rised from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and guarded himself, 5. After that, he poured water into a bosom and began to wash and he wiped them with the towel where he was guarded. Next verse. Then cometh he to Simon Peter and Peter said unto him, Lord, does thou wash my feet? Next verse. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Next verse. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. 
Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Next verse. Jesus said to him, He that is washed needed not save to wash his feet, but is clean every week. And you are clean, but not all. He was talking about Judas Iscariot. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. Next verse. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Next verse. You call me master and lord and you say well for so i am next verse if i then your lord and master have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet so he was teaching them service it's not a supposed to be washing people's legs in church we are not muslims who wash leg every day it's not a practice it's a teaching but he communicated in a figure of speech <laughs> fantastic fantastic I'm ready for the live audience. I just take one, two, three, and I'll do that quickly, quickly. As soon as you stand up, tell us your name, then fire your question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. My name is Ifoma. So during the course of the teaching, you mentioned um, rewriting Acts chapter 2, verse 4, where you said that when we speak, um, we are being filled with the Spirit. Right. So I'm wondering, can someone who is not filled with the Spirit speak? Or does it being filled actually mean, are you referring to something else in that aspect? When you're born again, what are you born with? The born with the Spirit. Sir. So the Spirit is inside you. He lives in you. So what do you do? You speak. When you speak, what does he do? He fills you up okay. through your speaking. Is it clear? Okay, Bless you. Thank you. Okay, Global Baba, let me just build on a question. Was that Acts chapter 3 or Acts chapter, chapter 2? 2. 2. Verses 1, 2, 3, 3 and then 24. Yes. And then um, the other one was uh, Ephesians 5, 18, 18 yes. to 19. Yes. So, Global Baba, you say that we have to resolve that parallel, that difference. Yes. In, uh, doctrinally. Yes. In favor of Acts chapter 2. Yes. Verses 1, 2, 3 and 4. Yes. Why not in favor of Ephesians? Because Ephesians is doctrine, Acts is narrative. Acts is eyewitness account, what somebody stood and saw. Ephesians is doctrinal because it is what was taken out of the canon of scripture. So we use that which is authoritative to correct eyewitness account. Ah. So Malawi next, but okay. Let me do the Malawi inside the live studios here. Thank you very much. So, um, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Yes. That is where the question comes. Okay. Before that, I had understood that uh, it is a spirit field, born again, spirit field man that can speak in tongues. That was my understanding. No, your understanding wasn't correct. That, which, Any, when somebody is born again, spirit field, then it speaks in tongues. Wait, anybody that is born again has a spirit. You can't be born again without the spirit. So the moment you're born again, you have the spirit. And because you have the spirit now that you're born again, you speak in tongues. Then in that Where you're quoting, he says tongues are a sign for the unbeliever because he's talking about the gift of tongues, which is ministry in the local assembly. So when the unbeliever among us here are speaking tongues and interpret he knows that God is among us. That's what Brother Paul was communicating. How to use tongues in public worship. That's what you read. But the truth is, when you receive Christ, the Holy Ghost came inside you. So you now have the Holy Spirit. Based on that, you speak in tongues. That's why Mark 16, 15 says, This sign shall follow every believer in my name. They shall speak with tongues. I hope that's clear. It is, it is said in that place that speaking in tongues for unbelievers. No, it's a sign. It's not for how can unbelievers speak in tongues? They don't have the Holy Spirit. It is we that have the Holy Spirit that when we speak in tongues and interpret, it becomes a sign to the unbeliever. It's not the unbeliever. Go and read it again. Just now, one more, one more question, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, you have told us here that the perfect plan of God can only be found in Genesis 1 and 2. No, that's not what I said. Yes. What I said is that there are two perfect chapters in the Bible. Genesis 1 and 2. 
Genesis 3 is the fall of man. From Genesis 3 to Revelation is God's plan to restore man back to Genesis 1 and 2 before the fall. Is it clear? Uh, not because uh, um, in, that, uh, in that Genesis, <laughs> when Adam disobeyed God, yes. his eyes were opened. Yes. He saw that he was naked. Yes. Now, if he had not done that, yes. does it mean that at the perfect plan of God, we'll be going naked in this world? The word naked there didn't mean without cloth. Naked there means he was out of the glory of God. It doesn't mean naked, physical. It's a figure of communication. Bless you. I, I love him. Did he give us his name? Did he give us his name? Say your name. Elder Sondeona. Please put your hands together for Elder Sondeona. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Um, Global Baba, I just wanted to go back to, um, I agree with, um, just to stand with him. Yes. When you said believers should focus our prayers on discovering a reality in Christ. Yes. That that's what the, that's what the, uh, emphasis, the episodes, the emphasis, emphasis of, of the episodes. episodes. Yes. But the four gospels taught us how to pray yes. on material things. Yes. Why has it taken us so long to know this? Well, it has to do with teaching what has been taught over the years. You know, many pastors don't know, many, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament. Many pastors don't know that. They just follow the way the Bible is divided. Genesis, Malachi, Old Testament. Matthew, Revelation, New Testament. It has to take a lot of study to know that John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still Old Testament books with the promise of the New Testament. So the New Testament started in Acts. So because they think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are New Testament, so a lot of them, their teachings are in the four Gospels. They don't go beyond. Meanwhile, the real diet is the epistles, which are given to us, which are a reflection of who we are in Christ. Okay, I'm ready for calls. Okay, the live um, audience, the last one, for this edition of the program. Your name, where you're calling from? I love your glasses, by the way. Go ahead. My name is the Mighty Gideon. Ah. That's, the Mighty Gideon. That's a serious uh, name. Please, I want to deviate from what we are discussing today. I have um, an issue with tithe. We hold on to tithe very proper. No, and, you, uh, but... you hold, not we, you. Okay, my, my church. Okay. okay. We hold on to church. Uh, sorry, tithe. Okay. But one time we had a, a, an agree, a discussion with one of my friends, and he told me that uh, tithe is something of the past, that it shouldn't be practiced now. So I want some clarity on that. My, okay. Mighty Gideon needs a small clarity, yeah? Mighty Gideon. Mighty Gideon needs a small clarity. Mighty but we'll just Gideon. hold on to that. You no, will get a small clarity. Will, we'll get that in a moment. This caller. Hello. Hello. Many thanks for joining us. Your name, where are you calling from? Yeah, my name is Rich Christian. I'm calling from Enugu, Nigeria. Fantastic. Um, well, I'm really excited uh, to even talk to you today. Uh, I've been trying for days and um, times now. So I really want to say a big thank you to you since I came to um, your ministry, get to know your ministry. Uh, my life has changed completely. My knowledge of Christ has grown. And I can't be any happier in this world right now, but I'm so excited. Please. Um, I, but the only thing I wanted to ask um, is uh, how can someone really grow in prayer because i've been growing in words i had to get the bible start studying every day um but when it comes to prayer you know it's like an up and down thing and there is this teaching that holds strong in my heart i'm still trying to get over it and that's the teaching where you know they say when you try to pray and maybe you're constantly being distracted you're not really doing anything spiritual it's like heavens are locked down to you or something like that so uh 
through your teaching this morning, I, I've been I was in the service for both, both services anyways. Uh, I got to understand that we just have to speak. Yeah. But in a situation where you're speaking and you're still having a lot of distractions inside of you, um, and your flesh start feeling like, okay, I don't think this thing is working. What should you do in such situation? Okay. What you do in such situation is you take a fast. You take a fast and bring your body under with fasting. And then you pray. And then take an isolated place, lock up, and just be there where it's quiet. And pray in tongues until the distractions disappear. Because if you do, they will disappear. We all had those experiences. And it's continuity, perseverance that got us through. And let me advise you to order for my teaching on the myth of unanswered prayers. The myth called unanswered prayer. It's about 30 hours. It will turn your entire prayer life around. It's the, um, the myth called unanswered prayer. It will help you a lot. That's my advice. Bless you. And then Gideon, mighty Gideon. Yes, mighty Gideon. Titan is not New Testament. Titan is old testament however abraham gave didn't pay he gave tight in genesis but if you come to the new testament which is from the book of acts nobody paid tight nobody received tight jesus never paid tight jesus never received tight paul peter james john all of them none of them paid tight none of them received tight and the new testament church which we are is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus himself the cornerstone since jesus didn't do it and the apostles didn't do it we don't do it as a practice but what we have in the new testament is generosity we give generously we support the work of god if people in the old testament were giving 10 percent under the blood of animals how much more a man under the blood of christ we give more than 10 percent. so it's not a percentage thing it's a generosity thing in the new testament hope that helps you Malawi next. Hello, Global Baba and Intercontinental, Mr. Michael Bush. I'm Sunganani, right from Malawi. Global Baba, I really love your teachings, but I had a question or two about communion. Global Baba, you said we don't have to do it anymore, but Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. What did he mean by that? The word remembrance, and remember when Jesus said that it was in the book of Luke, he has not died, he has not been buried, he has not risen from the dead. And in the book of Luke, he was under the law. So he was made under the law, and he obeyed the law, and fulfilled the law, and took the law out. So because he was under the law, he now responded to them in the feast of the Passover. We don't have communion in the Bible. There's nothing like holy communion in the whole Bible. What we have is Passover. When he said, do this in remembrance, the word remembrance there in the original is the word understanding. Do this with the understanding of me. When Jesus died and rose, that Passover feast ended. That's why 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ, our Passover, has been crucified for us. So today, we don't eat bread and ribena. When we receive the teaching of God's word, in that word, we are eating his body and we're drinking his blood. That's what we do today. Okay, Global Baba, um, I don't know. I need to squeeze in a couple of questions and let's see whether we can take 30, 30 seconds each. Global Baba, why does life appear to be unkind and cruel to some persons, even when they are believers? Many thanks. James John. Well, it's not just because you're a believer. That's the way life is. And because men make choices. And men make choices but don't control the outcome of their choices. So because people are making choices and you can't control people's choices, within those choices are outcomes that bring wicked implications, dangerous, detrimental implications. Because James chapter 1 verse 13, 14, 15, 16 says that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own loss. And when it conceived, it will bring forth sin. And when sin is finished, it will bring forth death. So because of human choices and the outcome of it, that's why a lot of unkind, wicked things are in the world. But if you're born of God, be of good cheer. Christ has overcome. Okay, Global Baba, we must go. We must go because time says so. I'd like to thank all of us for being part of this edition of the program. My production team all joined me, Michael Bush, to thank you and to invite Global Baba to say 
that we should go home. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush, what a blessing to have you, man. Hey, listen, make sure you follow us on all the platforms, radio, television. I want to thank you for being a part of the broadcast today. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. We love you. Remember, we're here for you. We're here to serve you. And keep following all of our messages on radio, television, and on all the social media platforms. Till we see you again, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Goodbye from Uyo, Nigeria. Amen. Praise God.